Hello again. I'm coming to you to bring you another uh, Christmas story. I know that we're in Easter weekend, but I'm reading Christmas stories during this time that we're having to be uh, setting ourselves aside. Today, I'll be reading The Finest Gift. This is a story I wrote several years ago for our Christmas Eve service. The Finest Gift. I had been running for several blocks when I crashed abruptly into a stop into the wall of a man in a flowing blue robe. Large hands reached down and lifted me off my feet, feet that never stopped running. I found my face raised to the level of the dark-skinned, stern eyes of a regal man whose beard was just beginning to show signs of age. Those eyes held no trace of a smile. Boy, he said, matter-of-factly, directly into my face. What seems to be your hurry? I hazarded a fearful glance behind me and saw my pursuers round the last corner with shouts of ridicule, and one hurled my instrument in our direction. I saw, I saw it arc high in the air and come crashing to the pavement with a loud crack. Would I ever be able to play again? Lev, the leader of my oppressors, called in a voice filled with disgust. Don't come into our street again, Pete. You chased away all the strangers worth our attention. I see, said my captor, that you hurry to some important task. His face was stern, but his eyes showed both understanding and mirth. You might be more watchful of the crowds the next time you hurry. May I ask what brought on this chase through the streets of the city? He gently lowered me to the ground and awaited an answer. I I was just p p p p playing my dr drum on a c corner, sir, I began. He held up his hand to stop me and nodded in understanding. Then he looked down at my ragged clothes and the makeshift rope around my shoulders that dangled drumlessly, and I began to panic again. I felt the big man's eyes follow me as I ran back a few steps to look and find my beloved instrument. Some would not call it an instrument, and I must admit it did not look much like one fashioned from an old piece of hollow log that I found down by the seashore. I originally just thought it looked interesting and wanted to have something of beauty to call my own, so I took it home, such as my home was. A hollow place in the wall of the city, with some scavenged straw for a band, bed, and discarded piece of cloth for a door over the opening. I went unnoticed by most of the passers-by and only drew attention from the other street children when they needed someone to ridicule or, pro or persecute. It was by accident one day that I found the hollow log might present more than visual beauty, but a beauty for the ears as well. One morning, I dropped my wooden spoon and it struck the beautiful hollow log. The sound resonating from the tube was wondrous, toom, to toom, as the spoon bounced and came to rest. At first, I was <clears throat> contented to tap a beautiful tune for myself on the hollow tube of a log. Toom, ta ta toom, ta ta toom, toom, toom. Then, after watching the, some street drummers with their fine, fancy instruments, I learned to stretch an animal skin tightly over one end of the log and let the tones resonate from my drumsticks. pa 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 pum thrum pa 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 pum I was alone, with no one to care for me, or to fend for me. I had had to scrounge and scavenge to stay alive in this world. Gladly, no one noticed when I took up residence in my small cave, nor did they notice when I snatched a crust of fallen crumb in the marketplace. But I was getting bigger and needed some way, some gimmick, to earn my way to sustenance. I could not speak. I had no apprenticeship and no way to purchase one. 
I was becoming fairly adept at taking a morsel of, of food or two, but my skills at begging were limited by my lack of speech. Now, with my beautiful new drum, I was ready, I thought, to join some of the other street musicians on corners of the city market and play for my meals. The older boys were not too bad at, to me at first. They thought it funny when I tried to speak to ask for alms. They would laugh and jeer and mimic, saying, please for the poor just as I did. Then they would snatch all but a penny or two from my hand, slap me on the side of my head, and run away laughing. If all I could manage was a penny, they would leave that to me, but laugh just the same. But when I arrived to work with my makeshift drum around my neck that day, they crowded around me, pushing and shoving until I had to run for my safety. My precious drum lay on its side with the skins shredded beyond repair. When the rich man caught me up in his hand, hands and questioned me with his eyes, then he did something that I never thought any person of means would do for me. He set me down, took my hand, and walked with me to retrieve my damaged drum. What is your name, boy? he asked. I just let my gaze travel between the man and my drum, tears threatening to spill from my eyes. Come on, he tried. He tried again. I cannot continue to call you boy, can I? Who knows? Perhaps I'll call you drummer instead. Except, except I don't really know if you can play. I've never heard your talent, and it seems that your instrument is useless now. I couldn't let this one who was showing even the smallest kindness to me down, so I snatched up the torn instrument and laid it sidelong in front of me. With my fingers, I began to tap the sides of my log, uh, my log drum. Ta tum tum tump, ta tum tum tump. He laughed and smiled again down at me. So you are a drummer, at least one who tries anyway. He said. I'll tell you what, little drummer, my friends and I are on a special mission. Why don't we, why just today we learned of our destination beyond this great city of Jerusalem. We are in need of some help with our caravan and some entertainment, he continued. Perhaps you would care to join us on our journey to the small village away from here. There are sights to be seen and wonders to behold. Would you be interested in that? For once in my life, my speech was impaired by more than the, my tongue-tied tongue demeanor. No one had ever offered to make me a part of something before. I nodded as I picked up my drum and raced through the city streets. This time, with joy and not fear on my heart, I got to my house and gathered all the important belongings I had, my extra shirt, two small pieces of bread that had not yet become too stale to eat, and my best drumsticks. I had left them at home so as not to lose them on my first day of playing my drum in the market. Then I ran back to the marketplace where I had last seen my benefactor, and he was gone. Gone with his camels, with the servants, Gone with the well-dressed friends who were with him, I ran up and down the street looking everywhere for them. But they had moved on while I had been gathering my worldly goods. It dawned on me that I had never answered the man's question, never given him my name. Not only that, but in my joy and my haste, I didn't even learn the final destination they fa faced after leaving the city. Would they turn north or west? to go to this place of, of sight and wonder to which they traveled. I ran back to the owner. I, I ran back to the corner where Lev and his friends were singing off key in the hopes of earning a coin or a crumb. At first they didn't notice me as I stood there with my world on my shoulder and my drum hanging absently from my hand. When he did notice, 
Lev only hurled a stone in my direction and shouted again for me to leave this corner. Besides, he yelled, I thought you had run off with those foreigners to Bethlehem. Everyone saw you talking with them. Go on, leave, and take your silly toy with you. Dejected, I began to walk away. No longer hungry, I let my drum drag at my side, and then it hit me. What had Lev said? Bethlehem. My new friends were going to Bethlehem. I ran to try to catch them. As I left the gate of the city, I could see just the remnants of the great caravan, and I followed as, at the fastest pace I could keep. Fortunately for me, they stopped to camp before I completely lost sight of them. I think that they were almost to Bethlehem. I walked up behind the central tent of the camp and heard the voices from within. We will camp the night and start our search with first light. I heard a voice state. Then I heard the voice of the man with kind eyes. This must be the place, he was saying. See how the stars reappeared to guide us and how it rests over the village ahead. We must rest the night, said another voice. Then we must prepare our fineries to bring to this new king. It was at that moment that the rough hand of a servant touched my shoulder. Who are you and what do you want? The boy, no more than two years older than me, asked. I was all I could stammer. He took me by the arm and led me away from the central tent over to a fire. I realized that the night outside the city was becoming cold in the setting, with the setting of the sun. My new friend, he told me his name was Joshua, brought me some soup from a boiling pot and encouraged me to eat. I had been so intent on catching up with the caravan that I'd forgotten how hungry I always was. When you're ready, Joshua said, tell me your name and what you're looking for. M -m 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 drum. I said, pointing to the damaged instrument at my side. Joshua seemed to understand and left for a moment, returning with a small swath of animal hide, just about the right size to replace my damaged drum skin. Together we pulled it tight over the end of my drum and fastened it with thongs <clears throat> to the tacks I had used to hold the old drum skin in place. Papam, I tested the new skin with my fingers. Emboldened by the beauty of the tone, I tested my best drums, drumsticks on the surface. Papam, thrum, pa -pa -pa pum I grinned my thanks to Joshua, and then at the stirring of some of the others, I had to, I ran to hide lest I be discovered and, ca and cast out into the darkened night. I found to I found a comfortable place among the baggage of the caravan and fell asleep, my stomach full for the first time that I could remember, my mind filled with talk of signs and wonders and, what had he said, kings? Just before sunrise, I, movement jostled me awake, and I snuck back to be unnoticed by the rest of the caravan. I dare not let these rich travelers see me, nor even my new friend Joshua, for fear of the trouble I might cause him. But even so, I snuck along with them as they entered and searched through Bethlehem for this site an apparently new star had led them to from far away. Throughout the caravan, there were more rumblings of the mystical star which had been spotted in the east and followed religiously until it had appeared outside of Jerusalem. I overheard stories of how the travelers had sought audience with the fearsome King Herod, how they were seeking the new king to whom the fresh star belonged. Others talked of how the sages of Israel were consulted and indicated Bethlehem as the prophesied birthplace of the long-awaited Messiah. And so here we were, searching house to house to find the object of the star. Mid-morning, my friend of the kind dies lifted his head to look at the sky above a simple nondescript house, and he gasped. The star! He whispered in awe, 
and, in, and the entire caravan looked in the same direction. And there, in the middle of the morning, stood a star. Some would say it hung as if some unseen hand had placed it there. But from my perspective, the star stood on its one far-reaching foot on top of the little house. I heard the leaders of the group send Joshua to the door. His knock was answered by a woman holding a baby, not very old at all, certainly years younger than me. And then, beginning with the greatest of these travelers to the least of them, I watched as they knelt down, bowing their heads, as if in worship of the baby boy. The mother, Mary, I learned her name was, smiled at the sight, but offered no resistance or rebuke. She seemed to feel that this great spectacle was how things should be. Then I saw the man, perhaps the father, standing behind them in the doorway. Mr. Kind Eyes approached him and whispered direct, quietly with him for a moment. The father nodded and the servants were sent to retrieve great treasures from the pack animals. Packages that had gone untouched throughout such a long journey were brought out and opened before the young family. They had brought their finest and left it before the child. What I could, what I could make out were caskets of gold, sealed bottles of fine incense, and pungent cakes of myrrh, all gifts fit for a king. As the day began to move on, Joshua saw me standing to the side. He came to me and said that the caravan would be leaving, but they would not return to Jerusalem. It seemed that the leaders of the group had all had dreams the night before. In each dream had come a warning that the band should not return home through Jerusalem, but take a different route. What is your name, my friend? Would you want to travel with, you, with us? Did you see the baby who will be king? Joshua asked. I only stood there in bewilderment at what I had witnessed, and then I realized that even Joshua, the servant boy, had offered a small token of a jeweled necklace to the baby, and I had nothing. I felt my best drums. I had nothing. I felt my best drumsticks in my hand, and I brushed the top of the drum with my fingers. Then I quietly walked up to the family, just as they were turning back to the house having said all their goodbyes to the travelers. M may I? I asked. Mary turned her attention to me and saw the radiance of the and I saw the radiance of the baby's face in her arms. She looked at me as if in question. My name is Zach, I said, noticing that my stammer was disappearing. I have no fine gifts to bring. But if I may, I will give you my finest. Together, the mother and father smiled and nodded for me to continue, and I played. I played my drum for him. I played my best for him. And he smiled. At me, he smiled. As I finished with a last thrum pa pa pum he smiled again. I let my drum, my finest possession, slip from my arm and rest at his feet. Hope you're enjoying these Christmas stories and I hope they're bringing some hope during this desperate time. I'll see you with another story later on. Thank you.